Good morning. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen, and you lead with your program is welcoming you. We have this online dialogue today called Recovery and Reconstruction through Municipal Partnership Project. So the format is a little bit new because this is not a conference. We won't have the presentations you'll just listen to. It's just a chance for us to talk. Like we have, we had so many questions during the registration. We've collected these, and I think that today are moderators of the sessions. They'll try to look for the answers and this is the dialogue we have questions but still no answers for these because starting from february 24th we all stay in this continuum it's still ongoing and we have these constant questions like what the life will be how will the communities look like what will happen to us to our infrastructure what will happen to our services what will be with what will happen with people who will be the beneficiaries of the services and we will try to talk today about these things unfortunately the war is still there and it will last. Uh, this morning we had the shelling even in Kyiv region. Uh, for quite a long time we haven't had these, by the way. Well, let's say within recent weeks. Uh, I do think that we'll have so many moments which will somehow spoil our infrastructure, des destroy infrastructure objects. As our HQ says, that infrastructure object, when it's hit, like, okay, the object of infrastructure may be something important, something not, but all of this, these are capital uh, expenses. This is our country, these are our homes. So this is something that we live with. We have to talk like about how to save these and uh, if these are destroyed, if these are damaged, how to restore them, how to resume our normal living, living normal infrastructure life. So today we will have two sessions. First session, which starts at 10.30, called Recovery and Reconstruction of Physical Infrastructure uh, of Damaged Municipalities. The second one after the break at 12.15, called Local Economic Adjustment in an Economy at War, because we don't have to recover something after the war, something that was damaged. We need to leave, live now, you know, and function somehow and to collect taxes, pay pensions and social expenses there as well and maybe develop somehow because uh, crisis is a window of opportunities they say, we'll see what it will be after the crisis. We have a couple of new rules, unfortunately we have to present because we have shelling, we have uh, uh, threats for life and health potential threat for our people in some of the regions, so the rule is really simple. If there is a red alert in Kiev, we turn it off, we go to shelters, we wait for this to be over, and then we resume. If it, there is no air raid in Kiev, but it is another region where you are located in any region of Ukraine, you do turn off a uh, computer, you go to shelter, and then you come back. If you don't come back, you can get the recording which will be accessible on the website where you registered and on Facebook, you lead with Europe. Safety is above all, it's a priority. We understand that we all just accommodate somehow, adjust to it, but please, let's be responsible. Let's try to save ourselves to restore Ukraine, to recover, to ensure the recovery. Due to this damn shelling, uh, unfortunately, uh, we've changed the first panel, the first session, Ms. Halina Menayev, who is the head of Chihuyev community. Unfortunately, she can't join us because this night again we had another shelling of Chihuyev and there is a total blackout there. We talked to Ms. Halina, she said to us, if we have electricity and mobile internet, I'll be with you. But unfortunately, there is no connection with her, there is no electricity and she can't join us, unfortunately, physically. If something changes during the day, of course we will uh, join her, but this is the reality. I don't think that we have another conference in the world uh, where this is a unique thing for us when participants can't join because of shelling. We need to remember about it, never to forgive, because something is there, something that should be carved in our national memory. And these walks to shelters, I think, these will stay with us forever. So, 
Look, right now, we have some welcoming words and opening comments. I can see we have all our welcoming speakers with us tuned in, and I can see them on the screen. So right now, I'd like to pass the floor to a person who is traditionally very active, helping you lead with your program, our specialized ministry of regional development, uh, development of communities and territories, min region, as we call it usually. Ministry of Development of Communities and Territories. Mr. Ihr Korhovei, Deputy Minister for EU Integration at the Ministry of Communities and Territories, will get your sound as well. Good afternoon. Do you get my sound well? Thank you so much. Uh, you are very right. This is not just a part of our history. This will become a part of our DNA. For us to survive, we, we won't just remember something that is happening. We will just transfer it to other generations. So just a little bit of lyrics to you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear allies, I'm really glad to see you all today. First of all, I'm so grateful to you, Leader JZ, for the organization of this very important event and uh, availability of such a dialogue and participation of highly qualified experts is definitely crucial for our state. That's what we need. That's what our government needs. Municipalities do need it to search for correct solutions, proper solutions, short-term solutions, and uh, the long-term planning, of course, for us to plan how to live in future. Our ministry, regions, communities, we work actively to solve those acute problems and to make those timely tactical decisions, you know, that uh, we need to take due to this uh, full-scale aggression invasion of Russian Federation, they destroy our cities every day, our towns, our villages, just destroying them to the very ground, and they kill our citizens. So what are our priorities for today? Of course, just to survive, just, just to stand, just, you know, to ensure that our citizens get their basic needs satisfied, because we are, have this new heating season upcoming. Housing for IDPs, preparing for the heating season, for winter season, so uh, repairing the damaged infrastructure, quick repairs where it's possible, ensuring citizens with some basic services. This is the everyday joint work, and uh, this is one of the key challenges for the ministry and for the government and for the municipality and regional authorities. So the Ministry of Regions is keeping uh, its focus on the uh, mid-term and long-term perspective. So the issue of recovery, the so-called Marshall's Plan, as we call it, and the Ministry of Regions with the experts of Kyiv uh, Economic School and under their guidance, under the World Bank guidance, we do before, carry out this pr preparation of the report on direct losses of infrastructure direct economic losses and indirect losses due to damage to infrastructure and the preliminary evaluation of Ukrainian needs for funding. Such evaluation is definitely what we need for future analysis, for forecasting, to get the estimates on losses on the scale, on the national scale of losses, and also the regional losses, and for future trials. And according to the report, uh, as of June 13, the total amount of direct direct documented losses in housing, uh, for housing and non-housing inf uh, infrastructure, over $95.2 billion, that is. So just imagine trillions of grivnas taking that currency rate. So of course, the housing sector uh, suffered from the majority of losses. So the assets of private business minimum $8 billion, and these just increase 4.3 billion direct losses in agriculture due to the war. So next month, uh, our team will be, uh, will update the data. So uh, right now, there are so many challenges for Ukraine. Protecting our country, defending our country against aggression, military aggression, ensuring proper uh, conditions for people losing their housing, creating opportunities for people who came uh, abroad just for them to return, to bring them back, preparing for very harsh winter season, and of course, 
planning our future. That is why the possible tool in this uh, process, what can we use? Implementing the initiative of Mr. Zelensky's initiative on uh, patronage establishment. So. Uh, for certain countries to become patrons of our regions and towns and cities, EU countries and other partner states, for them to help us to reconstruct the destroyed areas and destroyed regions. So we are so grateful to the President of the European Commission, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, also to Mr. Charles Michel, uh, the management of uh, the EU Regional Committee, and many, many our colleagues for their support of this initiative. So now we are in the process of certain institutionalization of this initiative, and you lead is playing a very important role as well here. So we do we do hope we do hope that this initiative will grow and transform into some practice something more practical. And apart from that, we are also process the concept of uh, partnership database for Ukrainian communities, as we say, which can structure and join at one open platform all necessary information on agreements concluded and partnerships between Ukrainian regions and our uh, partnering countries. So everything that we plan, uh, everything that we will recover uh, and restore, it will be absolutely energy efficient and absolutely inclusive. Therefore, I will not take a lot of your time. Thank you again for this event. Thank you for inviting me. And I wish all of us to have very fruitful discussion. Thank you, Ihor. Thank you. And we really want this initiative to actually become a platform to become a project. And we've gathered here today just to talk about how Ukrainian communities should prepare high quality projects and draft them in the municipal partnership in particular. And you actually set the tone, but you also mentioned European partners as well. Without them, there is no you lead with your program because actually European Union and the member states are the founders of it. Without European partners, we won't have the victory and we won't have recovery. So I uh, pass the floor to Natalia Starostenko, sector manager, regional local development, delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. Ms. Natalia also takes part in our events. Traditionally, she's with us as always. And my gratitude and please, I pass the floor to you. Thank you so much, Yevhan. I will use English on behalf of the EU delegation. Dear Deputy Minister Korhovic and dear local leaders from Ukraine and the EU countries. On behalf of the European Union delegation to Ukraine, it is my pleasure to welcome you at the dialogue devoted to the crucial topic for Ukraine, recovery and reconstruction at the municipal level. And let me sincerely thank you, Lead with Europe, for organization of this very important event. If we admire the reaction of Ukraine, uh, of the Ukrainian state uh, in the uh, last months, it is also due to resilience of local communities, which now are playing a prominent role in standing up to the Russian aggressor. Decentralization is considered to be a signature reform uh, for Ukraine. And uh, we all know that a very important document for Ukraine, the European Commission's positive opinion on Ukraine's application for the European Union membership reflected the merits of this reform. Uh, beyond European Union pre-accession process, the European Commission's position is also clear for the significance of decentralization in reconstruction in which the municipalities must be integrated. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, stressed it in the recent uh, Ukraine recovery conference in Lugano. President Zelensky, as uh, Deputy Minister Korhovi uh, already mentioned, called for twinning partnerships between Ukrainian and EU municipalities in, and regions. And of course, Ursula von der Leyen and uh, uh, the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, uh, echoed this, and uh, they emphasized the importance of peer-to-peer -peer partnerships between cities and regions um, in EU and Ukraine, which should uh, enrich and accelerate the reconstruction. Uh, and a little bit of history. Since 2016, uh, the European Union invested over 150 million euros to support the development of local self-governance in Ukraine 
And today we are at the event of You Lead with Europe program, uh, which is funded by the EU and its member states, Denmark, Estonia, Germany, Poland, Slovenia, and Sweden. And of course, we all know that You Lead has been recognized, a recognized partner of, on the ground on which municipalities could rely for many years. We also have an ongoing OECD project called Supporting Decentralization in Ukraine. And this project is actively working on the analytical report on decentralization and regional development. Uh, and uh, this report will include analysis uh, of effective multi-level governance for crisis management and will look into options of reconstruction and recovery in Ukraine. The EU is also funding a variety of civil society projects which uh, have been um, uh, repurposed uh, in order to respond to the um, crisis in Ukraine, to the war situation, and now many of them are focusing on uh, IDPs, on infrastructure, and many other relevant topics. The EU plans to continue uh, its active support to municipalities, and we uh, fully understand that the local level will be in the center of rebuilding of Ukraine. And we should already think about the recovery, and I fully agree with Mr. Korhovi in this. We will have to act quickly and, efficiency, and efficiently, and we hope that the war will end soon. And such events as today's dialogue will bring us closer to the projects and partnerships uh, needed for the recovery and reconstruction at the local level. Uh, currently, via a series of forums and seminars, we are already collecting uh, relevant information. For example, we believe that today's dialogue will contribute to a better understanding of the EU rules and norms, as well as fundamental principles governing uh, municipal project financing. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here with the Deputy Minister Korhovi and uh, the EU delegation together with you lead are very much looking forward to cooperation with the Ministry on uh, establishment of municipal partnership projects. Because of the war, we are exploring uh, new avenues of action where the role of municipal partnerships has to be seen in a new light. Uh, leadership of the Ukrainian government is crucial in communication with the EU member states willing to support Ukraine at the regional and local levels, collecting proposals for various sectors, devising operational mechanisms for practical establishment uh, of partnerships, donor coordination. So I was very delighted to hear about this new initiative on the database of municipal partnership projects. Uh, we will very much welcome ideas and inspiration from the audience on concrete ways to, uh, on how to develop municipal partnership projects in the most beneficial way for Ukrainian municipalities. We need to integrate now all our intellectual resources to come up with the new ideas uh, shaping the future of Ukrainian hromadas. We are in the situation where everything is acceptable. The most incredible ideas, the boldest concepts. Uh, I wish all participants a fruitful discussion. Let's stay strong and stand together with our friends from all over Europe in these hard times of war, remembering that Ukraine is not alone in this fight for freedom. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Heroes, glory to heroes, Miss Natalia. Thank you so much. It's really so nice that we have this full support from EU delegation to Ukraine, like in many areas. In all areas, we do have this support. So we know that EU delegation to Ukraine will be the locomotive of this recovery. It will move the projects in that direction where they will definitely help us to recover. And we are grateful. Uh, for your support. Thank you for reorientation of the funding of the money within these projects. Thank you for covering our basic needs with that funding. With the help of you lead with your program as well. And my colleague Mariana Semenishin may actually tell about that because she was one of the key uh, 
uh, acting subject. So she was the emergency aid. She helped us to deal with these projects when we purchased generators, excavators, beds, blankets, and all that. You've seen that in the video. You've, you've seen that video before the car, before the dialogue. Uh, we had our colleagues in Germany packing the backpacks with uh, the emergency needs uh, packages. So definitely in you lead with Europe program, we had some very substantial changes. Please, Mariana, you're so welcome. Mariana Semenish, a uh, deputy head of Sustainable Development Unit, you lead with Europe, please. Thank you so much, Yevhan. Mr. Korhovi, Mr. Ostenko, dear participants of this technical dialogue, first of all, my gratitude for your warm words. Uh, for you lead with Europe, I'm really honored today to greet all of you on behalf of you lead with Europe program and definitely greetings. Welcome at this uh, first event that we call a technical dialogue. Uh, a conversation which will be dedicated to recovery and reconstruction issues, reconstruction of municipalities in Ukraine. So, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Yevgen, yes, you lead with Europe since the very first day of Russian full-scale invasion helped Ukrainian municipalities with consultations, with training. Uh, the key thing that we do for seven years, we've been doing that, and we provided also the emergency support and we provided it to more than 300 communities. So the f emergency need packages, technical means, equipment, actually, which will help to restore their infrastructure and to involve more funding and to bring people back, which is more important, bring people back to their communities and their municipalities. We, uh, as Ms. Tarastanka mentioned, we also uh, enhance this partnership between municipalities from EU countries and Ukraine. But coming back to today's event, we'll talk today about uh, the short, mid and long term recovery perspectives. I do hope that we'll talk about the modernization of Ukrainian municipalities. We have a good chance to get some experience of, from those municipalities and countries who had similar process of recovery. Uh, and they have their own practices, I mean, Slovenia, Croatia, Western Balkan states. And I really want you all, please, when you listen to our speakers' contributions, start thinking on how can we use their experience, their practices in the country, how can we implement it? Because we need to be very critical and we need to analyze it properly, you know, when it comes to practices and when it comes to its implementation in Ukrainian conditions, in current conditions. Today we'll talk about the physical infrastructure recovery and also about creation of comfortable, convenient, you know, I'd say convenient conditions for people to live on and how to return them to their municipalities. We'll talk about sustainable development, integration of IDPs, new dwellers in the communities, and I'm really uh, grateful to all the speakers who managed to join us, who managed to join our dialogue. I do want you all to have critical approach, critical thinking, to use it, and please uh, do implement the solutions and ideas you'll generate. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Mariana. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Big gratitude to our welcoming speakers. I do hope that you'll stay during the dialogue. But we will definitely understand if you have to leave because of your work, especially Mr. Ihor in the ministry. Of course, we understand. Mr. Korhovei promised that you'll watch the video afterwards. This uh, promise me. This will be the agreement. Okay, colleagues. So this was the this was the end of opening comments. And as my colleague mentioned, my, as Mariana mentioned, this is a technical dialogue, a conversation. So today we'll have questions, answers, and please don't put it in the chat. We have moderation of the chat. At such events, we have questions. You previously sent us in the registration form. Our moderators picked some, maybe the most consolidated, to talk about these with the speakers. Okay, so we come to our first session, and I'd like to present right now the moderator, Mr. Serhii Trochemyshin. He's next to me. He, he has been here for all this time, but you didn't see. Serhii is the expert of regional project team 
This is the team within you lead with Europe, which deals with municipal partnership projects. They work with this initiative and said he works there. So today he will lead this specialized discussion on recovery of infrastructure, damage territories, reconstruction. I will not announce speakers. They're really very interesting. You've seen those. So he will do it himself. The only thing I want to remind, if in your region you have a raid alert, please go to bomb shelter. If we have a raid alert, we will do it as well. We have it here. So if you have this need, uh, you may actually later check the recording if you can't be present for the whole time here. So we understand that so many things you have to work with in your municipalities will have the recording, maybe not in Instantly, it takes time. We will actually place it at our Facebook account and also the, at the registration website. So, Serhi, please, I pass the floor to you. I think the conversation will be interesting. And I think that uh, Ukrainians are the nation. Actually, even in such difficult condition with the shelling ongoing, they think like where they will plant the beetroots next year. I think everyone saw in Kyiv region you know, in a tank, people are planting some beetroots. I guess this is our country. Therefore, we are unbeatable. Please. Thank you, Eugene. My name is Serhii Trochimishin, and we're going to talk about the reconstruction and recovery of the physical infrastructure for the damaged communities. We'll be working until 12 o'clock, so you have all the instructions in case of an air raid. Just to specify a bit for the newcoming people, please uh, write your comments, your questions in the teams so that we would be able to mention them. Now, going back to the topic of our dialogue, I should say that both Ukraine and the EU made a number of achievements and strategic documents just recently. An EU Commission has presented the recovery plan for Ukraine, which is a legal document that contains reforms and investments for Ukraine. And uh, looking at the contents, uh, I would say it's uh, a plan for rebuilding Ukraine. It will contain the grants and the land that will be provided under the budget of the EU for the upcoming periods. And the Ukrainian government is also preparing for the recovery. Currently, the National Rebuilding Recovery Plan has prepared its own plan. It will pre present it recently. Hopefully, you've read um, it. And I'll just make an outline. The plan is for 2030. It contains 850 projects for over 750 billion US dollars. And I should say that the portion dealing with infrastructure, that's something like 100 billion US dollars, but we understand that every day the aggression continues. We still have shellings, uh, just like today we had, and that is why the uh, head of the Chuguyev community was unable to join us. So that number of damages is growing. We don't know what it will be. And why am I mentioning those documents? So that our communities would be able to take them into consideration uh, in their strategic planning and development. So today we'll be covering uh, several international cases. We have representatives of uh, different countries who have already passed that conflict in the past. They've got some lessons learned out of that. And uh, we have to say that our first speaker from Croatia and the story of the conflict looked the following, the old Yugoslavia in the period from 1991 until 1999 participated in the Fourth War. It had 10-day war with uh, Croatia, then with Serbia, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, and with Kosovo. So as our first speaker will tell, that's the mayor of the municipality, and uh, Binko Kasana, I'm happy to welcome you. And if you could just add a bit about the experience of returning people from abroad, how this was happening. So, uh, Mr. Minko, you have the floor. 
Evo se vas uspak pozdravljam iz grada Lipika. Jednog grada koji možda niste znali ima i tekako duboke i uspješne veze sa Ukrajinom. Dakle, naša poveznica sa Ukrajinom je Ivan Franko, ukrajinski pjesnik koji je 1908. godine poravio ovdje u našim toplicama u Lipiku i nakon toga smo mi potpisali povelju prijateljstva sa gradom Drohovićom i bilo nekoliko puta u posjetu našim dragim prijateljima tamo. Evo moram reći da već iz toga vremena od 2011. godine u gradu Lipiku djeluje i udruga Hrvatsko-ukrajinskog prijateljstva koja sada se pokazala i tekako korisna za pomoć ukrajinskim izbjeglicama koje su smješteni ovdje u našem gradu, a isto tako naša, naša udruga je aktivna i šire, dakle u cijeloj Hrvatskoj pomaže i u suradnji sa veleposlanstvom. Kao što znate, Hrvatska je kao i Ukrajina danas napadnuta 1991. godine. Dakle, u državi koja je u to vrijeme bila 4,7 miliona stanovnika, napraviti su zaista velike štete. Ono što je tragično, 15 tisuća ljudi je poginulo, 300 tisuća raseljenih osoba, izgubili smo 180 kuća, odnosno domova. Ali evo, unatoč svim tim ogromnim gubicima, Hrvatska je danas ponosna članica Europske unije i za koji mjesec se običe i članica Eurozone. Grad Lipik je u obnovi, koja je zaista jedan sveobuhvatni projekt, učestvovala od samoga početka, dakle, odnosno završetka rata. Prvo ono što smo obnavljali, to je bila ona osnovna infrastruktura, dakle, koja je za, za, za bitna za život, to su ceste, vrtići, škole, zdravstvene ustanove i naravno ono što je vrlo bitno, to su domovi naših građana. Zatim smo obdavljali javnu infrastrukturu koji našim građanima omogućuju kvalitetan život da bi ih opće motivirali da žive ovdje i da se vrate. Posljedatna obnova je težak posao, moram reći, dakle, koji zaista iziskuje puno rada, puno truda, ali naravno isto tako prvenstveno se mora ulagati i polagati pažnje, to su građani. Dakle, pored onih svih materijalnih građani su ti koji e, treba posvetiti posebnu pažnju, e, jer oni su e, bez njihovog e, dakle, prisustva, nema smisla ni obnova, dakle, ni kuće, ni vrtići, e, ni škole, nemaju smisla ako nema ljudi. Dakle, ono što je bilo isto tako bitno, e, to je da grad predvodi obnovu, e, obnovu koja je, gdje je ljudski faktor dakle, bio e, glavni. E, još jednom napominjem, u svemu tome dakle, treba voditi računa o, 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 o ljudima i motivirati ih opće da se vrate i da žive u, u, u svome gradu. E, naše iskustva pokazuju e, da u, 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 u toj javnoj na prvoj vrsti, dakle, uvijek ističemo te ljude koje treba motivirati, ali isto tako i organizirati život. Dakle, u jednom razrušenom gradu treba organizirati život koji, koji nije samo one osnovne potrebe. Dakle, treba zadovoljiti građanima i sve ostale potrebe. Evo, naš grad Lipik, dakle, prošao je svu tu fazu, imamo našu Udrugu. Imamo naše prijatelje evo, u Drohobiću, čvrste veze sa Ukrajinom, sa ukrajinskim veleposlanstvom ovdje u Hrvatskoj. Dakle, imamo e, dobru razvojnu agenciju, imamo puno iskustva evo, i u obnovi, a imamo tako isto puno i u iskustva i u, i u predpristupnim fondovima, u e, europskim fondovima, natječajima koji su sada. I evo, spremni smo zaista surađivati na svim mogućim projektima sa našim prijateljima iz Ukrajine. Dakle, i evo, tu smo, stojimo na raspolaganju, sigurno kao i većina gradova u Hrvatskoj. Evo i na kraju, slava Ukrajini. Hrvijem slava. Dakle,
glory to our heroes. Thank you. Thank you for your introductory work and the briefing, indeed. In Ukraine, we've, uh, lo we didn't have too much uh, information about the conflicts before the war, and now we need to learn the um, experience of other countries in order to uh, identify the roads ahead. As the Winko has said, the war in 1991, it took over 15,000 lives, over 300,000 of people turned IDPs, and uh, around 180,000 of uh, infrastructure facilities were damaged. The symbol of that war was the city of Vukovar. It was under occupation for four years. At the same time, Croatia managed to recover pretty fast, and I'd like to pass the floor to Sanka Hovart, uh, she, the uh, director for the Agency of the Regional Development. So uh, I do have a question. Why Croatia, well, how did you manage to recover your economy that fast? So uh, Sanka, you have the floor. Thank you very much tonight. Uh, dear, ladies, dear ladies and gentlemen, no. I'm very honored to... I'm very honored uh, to be with you today. I will give you some insight of reconstruction and recovery of war damaged Lipic and some lessons that we have learned along the path. Uh, the city of Lipic is located in Požega in Slavonia County in continental part of Croatia. Um, some figures that, figures that I uh, can say are that we have uh, 64,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, Lipik, as one of the towns in the county, has 5,000 uh, inhabitants. So we are a small country and Lipik is a small town. Uh, Lipik is... Uh, okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Lipik is well known as a health spa. Uh, the settlement uh, was built around the natural thermal spring that were recognized as far back as Roman times. Uh, but then uh, uh, in 1991, during the Homeland War, uh, Lipik was totally destroyed. Uh, the next slide, please. As Mayor already said, uh, some figures, uh, some facts, uh, there were many dead and uh, many missing pe uh, persons, but uh, what is important to stress that today uh, Croatia is an independent country, member of the UE. Uh, this year it will become the member of Eurozone. It's planned to be the member of the Schengen Zone as well. Next slide, please. And also, uh, Lipik is again the tourist and health center known for its spa and lipid sauna horses, spring water products, and also a glass production, uh, mostly for cars for uh, Bentley, Lamborghini, Ferrari. So Lip Lipik has passed his recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, on this path of reconstruction, we have learned many lessons that I would like to share with you. Uh, one of them is to set the rules and conditions for the reconstruction and incentives. Uh, in incentives in Croatia were introduced uh, for the return of people with an investment for entrepreneurs and salary system. Uh, in Croatia, we have a law on special state concern that defines these issues. Uh, since reconstruction is mostly done by, by citizens and municipalities and state, it's key to have uh, units dealing with reconstruction in the area. Uh, as I have told you, Lipik was totally destroyed. Uh, people have moved away, but they were, con they were concentrated in cities close by. After the war, they wanted to return, but they could only uh, when public and at least basic functions were put back, like schools, banks, hospitals, along with the reconstruction of houses, of course. And also, an uh, important issue is ownership. Uh, we needed to manage land and facilities ownership very carefully and planned accordingly. 
the next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, we have learned that we have to concentrate on people as well, uh, not only on infrastructure. And here are some lessons that we uh, have learned. Uh, it's very important to start reconstruction as soon as possible when people still want to come back. Uh, carefully build houses and other infrastructure to fit the needs of the people. There will be lots of building, uh, lots of activities, and it is very important to assure that quality of building is good. Uh, recovery is so social, not only uh, to concentrate on infrastructure and on concrete and construction infrastructure. Uh, then uh, reconciliate. Um, uh, reconciliation is a vital component of the recovery process. Please bring together ethnic groups to address this issue. And last but not least, make sure to cooperate with EU municipalities and share experience as this will improve the process, uh, like you have started to do this today. The next slide, please. Uh, when talking uh, of future, thinking of future and planning. Uh, municipalities and regions have many things on their mind. Uh, there are many programs and development initiatives we need to be careful of. Um, from territorial and regional development to keep people out of capitals uh, to many other. Uh, for example, in our region, we also have industrial transi transition to help industry grow out of the region by developing, developing new products. Uh, along uh, there came many other strategies, policies from climate change to social and healthcare. Some regions and municipalities finance their growth largely from EU funding, others don't, but the challenge is the similar. Uh, to, to achieve these results, uh, in many of these areas, from housing to climate action, we need to build coordinate, uh, coordination, integrating national policies in local and vice versa. Uh, build partnerships, local and regional, as none of us is strong enough to achieve results alone, and also engage shareholders in the projects, because shareholders assure quality, quality of the projects and distribute project results uh, to groups of people projects I uh, intended uh, to. Uh, and the next slide, please. And to conclude, uh, I would like to stress that uh, Lipik is still rebuilding, but it is also in developing. Uh, developing its spa and health center, its state stud farm and hippodrome for Lipitzaner horses, and so many other uh, projects and issues. But also it has many other uh, new projects, as you can see on the slide, and one of them uh, will, once when it is finished, make LIPIC uh, the center of artificial intelligence development. LIPIC has already established an, an entrepreneurial in incubator for artificial intelligence. Next phase of the project consists of the construction of the business district area within the campus. Uh, the project is national, of national interest uh, and faculties, universities, institutes uh, and also county and ministries are involved in its, in its implementation. I hope that your recovery and reconstruction uh, will be fast and successful. Uh, and I hope we will have a chance to develop some projects together. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you. I was uh, listening very attentively to your presentation, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty much impressed because I didn't know a lot about the city of Lipik, but now I really want to go there because uh, we are 
interested like how this uh, this center for artificial intelligence could be established as well as uh, whatever projects you have on the use of thermal waters but i have a question from our participant that question we've heard a lot what were the sources of funding for the recovery of infrastructure was that funds uh, was that grants were that lands uh, money uh, lands uh, what is the uh, sources of funding for implementing all those projects? Uh, well, the sources was, uh, were, as you already said, uh, from different uh, fundings, uh, from the state mostly, and then uh, from the counties, and then we got and European funds, uh, some uh, the donators were activated and were funding uh, reconstruction. Uh, and in nowadays, since Croatia is a part of European e Union, we finance a lot of our infrastructure and soft uh, projects through European funds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, uh, there's another question from our audience. How do we engage the local population to the recovery and rebuilding process? Well, people are eager to come back, to restore their houses, to restore their lives. And uh, some of the lessons learned that I already have told you uh, uh, that we need to uh, act as soon as possible. We need to organize them to have a chance to come back, to, to uh, organize uh, uh, reconstruction of their houses, to organize them to, to find their job. Uh, Lipik was totally destroyed as a town, and uh, people needed to come back but also they needed a job. Uh, not everything was functional right away, but uh, the, um, uh, the institutions were put back partially, and then people will work partially at the Lipic, sometimes in uh, places nearby. So it's a process and uh, you will uh, find your way uh, how to uh, organize this as much as it is possible. I understood you. Thank you. Now there is another question. Just recently, there was uh, uh, an increase to like functional opportunities for the agency for the local development. What was the uh, role of the agency of regional development in, in the renovation and the rebuilding process in your country? Uh, yes, we have uh, this initiative for uh, industrial uh, transition. Uh, so, uh, what our Ministry for um, Regional Development, and they were doing it together with uh, World Bank, uh, and with us, the counties and regional development agency, we came up with this industrial transition, uh, transition plan uh, in order to uh, facilitate and to help uh, our businesses to work together, to make the change uh, in order to have their product that will be uh, something new, something uh, uh, new, something uh, with more, um, let's say, maybe to put some intellig uh, artificial intelligence in those products uh, to be more innovative. So uh, this industrial transition, this plan is now in a um, phase that it, it will need to be uh, performed, to be um, in a, in a put in, in a um, uh, position to, to, to carry it on. And we will have EU fundings uh, to realize uh, this transi transitional uh, plan. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And we have one more question. You've participated in the rebuilding of several cities after the war. And from your experience, the projects in which spheres are uh, producing the most, uh, um, well, increase in the uh, development of the economy. So what are the most effective projects in terms of the development of the economy? Well, it's not an easy question, but let's say if we are talking about the economy, uh, what we have started in this area is making uh, preconditions for entrepreneurs to start their businesses. We were building the business zones, uh, business incubators, uh, forming uh, business uh, agencies who were helping uh, business sector, business entrepreneurs uh, to start their, build, uh, their businesses. Uh, together with the ministries, there was a program for um, this uh, development of medium-sized entrepreneurs. And also together with this, uh, people needed some, um, or let's say big firms, they needed uh, some laws uh, on which they could work on and to, uh, to get some um, incentives uh, how to rebuild and how to get some incentives to come to those areas and to uh, start again doing businesses. So through the salaries and through these um, incentives, they could operate with less, uh, um, with less um, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, with um, more effectively and uh, not so, uh, and, and a little bit cheaper. I understood you correctly. So in the beginning, you've created the conditions for the businesses, and then the business used that conditions, and that restarted the economy. And the same mentioned by Mr. Vinko when he said that in the beginning, they've created the infrastructure, and then the people were starting to uh, return to the infrastructure. Am I understanding you correctly? And then there is another question, like a follow-up question, I guess to both of you, how were you setting the priorities? I mean, what to rebuild first? Were there any strategic sessions or, you know, at once how to do that? Because now that's the question that we have in the list. And I can see that this question is coming uh, on and on in the chat. So what's the priorities? Anyone who's ready to I'll uh, give an answer to that question, please. Well, I'll try because I'm not sure whether the mayor uh, can uh, speak in English. Uh, uh, well, it's hard to say because <laughs> uh, Croatia um, was also... Okay, the, the war didn't uh, end like one day, and then we started uh, reconstruction the next day. Uh, so uh, some of the things are just done parallel. You had to uh, rebuild the houses in order to get the people to come back. But then you had to uh, do end the reconstruction of the schools and uh, health uh, care uh, institutions, and you had to rebuild uh, economy. Uh, but what is very important is what you are doing today, and that is that you are talking about it, that you have a consensus, that you have a platform on which you will uh, talk and you will uh, agree on what is your priority. And indeed, our today's meeting is a platform for the dialogue so that all the uh, communities would be gathering together in order to receive some answers to at least to some of the questions, because unfortunately we have a lot of questions and there's no answers, and uh, there's 
no experience that we could rely on in order to offer them with answers. So I'm very grateful to this conversation. It was an interesting one. And I hope that in future we'll be able to cooperate. You were talking about the possible cooperation. I think our communities heard this. And after this dialogue, part of them would be able to contact you and uh, to discuss the process, the mechanisms for cooperation, or how this could be you know, sat, because your experience is very important. We are currently uh, about to start the process that you had 30 years ago, so it's, it's very important. Thank you for this conversation. And now I'd like to pass uh, the floor to our next uh, speaker, Martin Horsling, an international expert from Netherlands, and he was responsible for the transport and infrastructure. And uh, he also participated in the post-war rebuilding. We're talking about the conflict between the Yugoslav Republic and the Bosnia and the Herzegovina. So, Martin, what conclusions can we make uh, at, by analyzing the conflict of uh, Yugoslav Bosnia and Herzegovina? Please, the floor is yours. Um, can you hear me? Tak. Looks, looks like. Uh, we should have a presentation, uh, which I hope somebody can put on the screen. Um, I first want to talk a little bit about the differences and the similarities. Um, I worked in central Bosnia, um, and it was essentially a low, a very low intensity conflict, which is completely different. The, the guns were smaller, everything was on a, on a on a lesser scale, and as a result, the damage profile was, was quite different, but still there was a lot of damage. Um, Ukraine obviously is completely different, and uh, you are better aware of what what is going on in Ukraine than I am. Um, it's just that what I want to say is that, you know, my experience probably is not entirely relevant for uh, for Ukraine, but we did learn some very interesting lessons on the next stage, on the next uh, slide. Um, and that is essentially that people are incredibly resilient. The moment the fighting stops, they will come back, if there is something to come back to. If it's total destruction, obviously, or you know they are very far away and have moved abroad, it will be a different story. What we um, what we learned is that actually you have to provide services almost from the moment that people move back in. Um, we didn't have that much destruction on sewage and wastewater treatment, but that will obviously be a huge problem in Ukraine. What we discovered at some point um, was that we actually didn't know where people were leaving their garbage. And that sounds very mundane, but what turned out was actually that where no garbage collection was provided, people would just carry it into the forest and dump it there. And it's probably still lying there. So the point I'm making is that basic services that a municipality normally provides should be put back into place as soon as possible, practically. Um, on the next slide, we have you know some some steps that um, that need to be be followed. That again, it, it's probably something you're already uh, doing right now. That's you know the damage assessment, and then you have to ask your question essentially which building you have to condemn uh, and then you know completely forget about it for the time being that's part of this prioritization uh, and which ones can be uh, martin can i or need full replacement yes Mr. Martin, this is Julia, the interpreter speaking. May I please ask you to keep the microphone of your headset a little bit closer to the mouth because your sound is slightly... Okay. Thank you so much. That's definitely better. Thank it's you. Like okay. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, so 
the thought of you know giving some thought on what can be rebuilt and what needs to be replaced, and then if you need to replace, uh, how is is a very important uh, uh, part of the the, the planning. Um, obviously. You don't do that in a vacuum, so you do have to consult with with the people on the the population, the people on the ground. Some of the decisions you may have to make may not be very popular. Uh, we'll come on that a little bit later. Um, and you need to, you know, get whatever support you can get from wherever in the world to assist you with the with the workload, but also to basically acquire knowledge. Um, from from other places. Interestingly, we we had um, we had some lessons that we we got on on housing. Um, it's probably the same picture as you are now seeing in Ukraine already. If it's a small private house, people will come back and they will move in and uh, they will start reconstruction. Mostly your job is to stay out of the way and make sure that they have whatever they need and obviously that it is safe. And people will uh, will want to come back. Um, my wife is working with Ukrainian refugees in France and the ones that have something to go back to in Ukraine really want to come back. So it is. It's very clear that that um, you have to provide them with this uh, this opportunity. Multi-story apartment blocks are, of course, completely different. Uh, first of all, the engineering uh, matters are different, but um, they may just fall apart, even though they are still standing. So um, this is far more a professional job. That that has to be seriously thought about on what you what you are going to do with this business or with these buildings. Um, in general terms, you have to think about what are you going to do with the rubble, and there might be a lot of recyclable materials in there, um, and that means you have to set up you know recycling plants. Uh, sorting of the waste and so on um, and see if, if something can be reused or it all has to be disposed of in a safe way. There's no point poisoning uh, your environment in, in, a, in a hurry. So the waste has to be dealt with very, very, very carefully, which is also a lesson we learned. Then. It's not all gloom and doom, in the sense that um, you also can have uh, the total destruction. Uh, sorry, uh, we are on the slide before the last one. Um, in Bosnia, as, as I said, the destruction was not that that enormous in most places, except you know, some places in Croatia and, and basically Sarajevo. But um, my previous job, one of my previous job was, was team leader in on the urban road safety project for the European Investment Bank in Ukraine. And one of the challenges we always faced was that what you need to do to make, uh, to change the, the urban environment was not possible because there's no space, there are buildings, uh, there is infrastructure. And where the destruction is now complete, you may actually see a opportunity to think about a much more sustainable city than what was there before. And this comes back to this, this build back better. Um, and, and that, yeah, I, I think that, that can be seen as a positive aspect of total destruction, even though it were much better if it never happened. Um, but again, you know, the 
the population has to be involved. And you have to be ready for uh, some disappointments because not everybody might be on board on, uh, on your plans. So communication will be very important. And probably, but I, I, I don't know that, uh, if that is even possible, you will have to find out where the people are that are abroad and be in touch with them. Um, I hope I gave a small contribution, but that basically uh, concludes my, my presentation. Are there any questions? I have a question from our participants and from me as well. First of all, what I was interested in, you mentioned that we need to talk to population. We need to have a lot of communication with people. The conflict between Yugoslavia and Bosnia Herzegovina was like in 1995 approximately. How did you do it technically then? We like uh, had no internet then, no personal computers, smartphones. These were focus groups or meetings with dwellers. Technically, how did it happen? Because right now we are, uh, especially in occupied territories, we have very similar situation. They block the internet. Quite often there is no mobile connection and you have to talk to people somehow. Um, I was working for the United Nations in, uh, in Bosnia and the civilian part of the, of the peace mission. And we did have more or less uh, access to the entire territory. And we had a department of civil affairs that was capable of actually going around and talking to people. Unfortunately, that, that is a, a very different uh, story than you will, will see in the occupied territories. If there's no access, you can't. That's, that will be a big challenge. But uh, again, uh, probably reconstruction will not start until uh, they are deoccupied those territories. Understand. Look, just we have a couple of questions there. So you said that you evaluated projects of uh, European investment banks. So in Ukraine, I mean, what would you advise to people who will design these projects? Maybe there are some typical mistakes or errors, or there are some templates uh, or algorithms we can use uh, to actually uh, apply. Um, as I said, my, my previous job in Ukraine was the team leader of the uh, Ukraine Urban and Road Safety Project. Technical issues, Martin Horseling is off, and we will try to reconnect with him again. Just give us a couple of minutes. Mr. Martin, do you hear us? Because you were disconnected. Yes, I'm, I'm, back. I'm back again. So it's, it's probably the Turkish internet. <laughs> very, I understand. The very last thing that we heard you started telling about your position, about your experience in the European Bank. So please. Okay. Um, so as, as part of the Urban Road Safety Project, we redesigned uh, sections of, of the road network to improve the safety. And that this was all in the cities. We worked in uh, Kiev, Dnipro, Kharkiv, Odessa and uh, Lviv. And one of the challenges we always had is that there is either not enough space or uh, the whole layout of the road network is such that um, you simply cannot do what you, what you should be doing. Um, you know, for example, one of the things we, we at some point discussed is is a bus rapid transit in Kiev. 
that no space. And um, the point the, the point I was making earlier is that if if the destruction is such that um, you have the opportunity to start completely from a blank page or an almost blank page or maybe a half full page, think first about you know sustainable uh, transport and, and ask yourself the question on, on how are people going to get uh, where they want, can you make a walkable and, um, and cyclable city and if you can or if, if that, that would in theory be possible, see if you can get it done. And that, that would then uh, you know, be a completely different city than you might, might see in some places right now. And another question from our participants. How exactly can our communities and municipalities interact with the uh, municipalities in Netherlands? How can they do it? Um, I think the, the way forward, but I, I cannot speak on behalf of the, the government of the Netherlands, but uh, I know the embassy in, of the Netherlands has quite a big uh, department interacting with, with Ukrainian communities. Um, and probably this should be channeled uh, to the ministry uh, to see if, if there is a way of a, of a process that that can bring municipalities in, in contact with each other. And another question that we have in the chat. So what interesting projects are being implemented today from the European Bank uh, within the territory of Ukraine? What do we have right now? So we have it from Novopokrovska municipality. So what interesting projects are being implemented right now uh, from the European Bank in Ukraine? We have this question from Novopokrovska community. And this is a question to me. Um, I, I don't know. Honestly, it's it's not something I can can answer because um, I'm at the moment uh, not working in Ukraine and not not engaged in, in the European Investment Bank. Um, their website will tell you what is what is happening. I know that the urban road safety project is still ongoing. But uh, they obviously are having a hard time, uh, like everybody else as well. Uh -huh. uh, we have another question uh, regarding the reconstruction. You mentioned that we need, we don't need to copy something, to copy paste it. If everything is destroyed, we can start from a scratch, a new, a new thing to be built, a new project. So how exactly our communities should uh, decide? Like, do we need to destroy it completely and start from the scratch or rebuild something we had previously? How to organize this process? Maybe you can give us the algorithm how you were doing this, how you organized the process. Well, in Bosnia, uh, as, as I said, we, we weren't directly involved with the, with the reconstruction because the, the people mostly did that themselves in the, in the rural parts, uh, and the destruction wasn't like that. Um, what I would do, uh, what I personally would recommend, is, as I said earlier, look at which buildings you can still rescue. Are they worth rescuing? That's also a question you have to ask. If it's a Soviet era, um, you know, what is it, Project uh, 509 uh, panel flat building, you know, do you really want to rebuild something like that, that that has a very poor energy performance and, and 
and so on, and is reaching the end of its life. Um, if it, the decision is to rebuild, then that's what you do. And you work your way around in terms of road network and, and cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure around those buildings that you still have. And then you fill in uh, the empty spots. When you fill in the empty spots, um, try to get a number of <coughs> standardized uh, designs that can be adjusted fairly simple and build them to the highest quality standard uh, in the sense of energy performance and, and so on that you can afford. So essentially don't make the same mistake again. You also, you also mentioned the energy efficiency. Uh, many municipalities right now have this question. Is it feasible, is it rational right now during the conflict? Is it rational to invest into energy efficiency? Um, at the, after the, the, the conflict, um, I'm not talking about during the conflict. But during the conflict, you do emergency repairs and, and you keep it running. But at some point, you know, the reconstruction isn't going to start probably tomorrow. And it won't be finished in the next 10 years. Hmm. Understand this. So you told us about the waste uh, management and utilization. You defined that the construction waste. You first think: Can it be recycled or not? Can we like use it again? And the whole process. And we also therefore have a question on how can this be organized right now in Ukrainian reality, especially in such towns as Irpin, Bucha, Chuguyev, uh, the mayor of Chuguyev, she couldn't even join us today because there is no electricity. How can we do it right now? Because we have this, it's highly likely that we will have shelling, not that high as previously, but still we have this fear of shelling and uh, there is a risk. How to organize this procedure? of waste management in a proper way? Well, um, obviously the, the, the shelling risk is, is, is real, um, but at the same time people are already cleaning up. So um, start with separating you know, the, the wood from the, the door frames and, and the, the window frames, you know, the, the PVC. Um, and pick out whatever else you, you can identify that can be recycled. And that's a good start. And then you will end up basically with a few piles of um, you know, PVC door, door and window frames that can be recycled. You will end up with, with wood that can be disposed of or burned or maybe reused. And a huge pile of concrete. That's a, that's a good start. And then the, the concrete at a later stage, you can, you can separate into concrete and, and other materials that are in there. And um, then you, ha you have already a, uh, a proper waste separation, at least for the time being. But safety first, obviously. If you do understand you correctly, just to, if you want to bring people back first, we need to provide services to people. Secondly, to ensure sustainable, efficient systems and security, of course. Mr. Martin, thank you so much for this conversation. I do hope that in future we'll be able to see you <laughs> or to work together in some project. And I'd like to go to our next speaker, Mayor, oh, Mayor of Kachevia Municipality, Vladimir Prebilic from Slovenia. So, 
Mr. Vladimir, as we know, you uh, actually weren't a mayor during the conflict time, but you had other problems, for example, high unemployment rate. As we know, in 2010, when you actually took mayor's position, the unemployment rate in the Kachevi municipality it was 27%. Within a very short period, you managed to decrease it by 10%. So our municipalities are in similar situation when we have lack of workforce. Please, can you tell us how you managed to do it within such short period to decrease the unemployment rate? Thank you. First of all, thank you for the question. I'm really happy to be with you today. For, and I have to start with uh, the expressions that we all support Ukraine with the, within the efforts uh, in the war. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar. We will also we will also host children from Bucha, that is our French uh, friendship city from Ukraine, and we are really happy to contribute and support you in any way you can. Uh, yes, you are really well informed. It's true. The unemployment rate was 27 percent. Now is uh, even less than 10. How we managed it? Well, I would say that the situation could be comparable, but there is nothing to be compared to war times. So we did not experience that. However. Uh, we did three things in order to increase the employment in our city. Well, the first one was to attract the foreign investments because we, not only in Slovenia, not only in municipality, were able to uh, create new jobs. So new companies should be attracted to our municipalities. How we do that? Uh, there were certain subsidies, in initiatives, if I may say. So we supported, uh, we, we prepared the land plots who were really cheap for the companies companies, future companies to buy. There was a special contract behind them, so they could get this land plot by a very, let's say, acceptable price. I would say uh, five euro per square meter is a very acceptable price. And this land was there to be built uh, for the investors. However, within the contract, they had to open new jobs. So if somebody did not deliver, the land was then um, bought back by the municipality. So this, we, we prevented these speculations that could uh, appear in these cases. Uh, this was one, one such case. The second one was we really supported the entrepreneurship among the young people. We established a business incubator. This is sponsored and uh, heavily supported by our budget. It costs us approximately between 250 to 300,000 euro a year. But what they do, they do three things. One is they support all the entrepreneurs in our municipality with all information that are in eligible or interesting for them. For example, if they would like to get uh, additional funding from the government or European Union, or uh, if there is something available on the market, this is one thing. The second thing, uh, we uh, support the startups. So uh, the companies that do not exist anymore, and they don't exist yet, but they will exist in the future. So we support it over the uh, help of Business Incubator. And the third, uh, the, uh, the last thing they do, they do is they also um, support uh, the entrepreneurship within the schools. What we found out is that our younger members of society are not so into business anymore. So with the help of our schools, that are in authority also uh, from the municipal municipality. We offered free uh, educational uh, curriculum and people are taking classes in which way and how they can create their own business, what may be the obstacles they have to uh, come across or try to uh, make him uh, uh, not difficult and so on. So all these things are done by the business incubator. And I said before, this is the third, uh, the second uh, support that we do for the for the investors in our municipality. And the last one, we also every year uh, make a tender, the tender that will support the younger entrepreneurs. And we offer up to 5,000 euro for every job they create from our municipal budget. I have to say when we started with this, and we are the only municipality doing this in Slovenia, when we started with this, people or let's say the, the business uh, uh, businesses were not really believing this is happening because you know who will give you 5,000 euro for basically nothing, well, for creating a job. Um, but um, after let's say two, three years, 
Today, we, when we make the tender, and tender is approximately 130,000 euro a year. When we make the tender, the finances are just sucked in. So we have so many applications uh, for this kind of approach, and I think this is the right right thing to do. Why? Uh, somebody would say, "What is 5,000 euro? It's not only the money that is that is there." For them, this there is a secret message that municipality really takes care about the businesses and entrepreneurship in our municipality. So it's a clear message that they are our member of society. They are supported, and uh, we also we send the message that they we care about them, how they are developing, how they are doing. Uh, all these things are important. Why? Because if the economy does well, then everything is possible. If the economy doesn't do well, then it's difficult. So these are just a few things that we did. Uh, and of course, if there is any kind of question, I will elaborate even more further. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I wasn't very aware uh, of that. I knew that this was a quantum leap for you to fight unemployment. This was really a powerful thing. I do hope that our participants will ask some questions, but I have another question here. The COVID topic in Ukraine is not the priority, of course, because we have the war. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, how actually you supported your business? Because there were other challenges, it was another type of crisis, but still certain parallels we may have uh, with Ukraine, something similar can be to Ukraine. So a question, how did you support the development of business and entrepreneurs in your community? So during the crisis, I, I can refer to the COVID crisis maybe because this was one that we have to handle and I believe we did well. Uh, just one information, for example, over the COVID period, we did not lose one job. This was quite interesting, uh, I would say, achievement. So how we managed to do so? Again, uh, first of all, uh, we uh, were when when we could step in because still, you know, the public and private should be separated. So you cannot just intervene where, however, you wanted to do that. So you have to be careful about that. What we did, for example, is we diminished the the bills for. Uh, the, the services we provide in municipality. For example, a water supply system uh, that should be paid by companies, uh, the bills were reduced and we covered a little bit of that. Uh, then the waste management, you talked before about the waste management, maybe I can also give you additional information on that afterwards. So this is also that something is provided by the municipality and we took the bill on us. Uh, the third thing was the taxation. So the companies who were severely um, under pressure because of the crisis, we uh, helped them by diminishing the bill or postponing the payment of the taxes they should pay directly to, to municipal budgets. And at the end uh, of all these things, we also made a public tender for those companies and businesses, especially this goes for uh, for um, restaurants that were, of course, closed over the COVID, or tourism that did not operate over the COVID. So all these things, uh, we made a special tender, and they could apply to a certain money that was provided from our municipal budget. So uh, there were some costs, overall costs every year, approximately 80,000 euro. That was something that was paid by the budget of municipality. Of course, many municipalities uh, followed our example. Uh, of course, again, this cannot be compared to the wartime, but nevertheless, we try to contribute as society. So uh, this is why the public money was spent. Again, it was the message to our companies, to our business entrepreneurs uh, who had problems, and we try to help them. Of course, somebody would say this is not a big amount of money, but again, it's not always the amount of money that could be provided. Uh, it's also the, the understanding that we care, that we share, and that we, like, we would like to help. Uh -huh. 
There's uh, a series of questions in the chat, and uh, the members of our dialogue are interested about this five thousand euro. Was that a one-time payment or a regular payment? Those five thousand euro that you've mentioned. Uh, you were uh, you were mentioning those five thousand euro as an answer to the previous question. Yes, yes. So this 5,000 euro can be awarded uh, when the tender is being uh, published. You can apply for this kind of money. You have to come up with a financial plan. You have to also come up with what are you going to do with this money. For example, you can buy a machine or you can buy other things that are necessary for your business that you're running. So um, you can get this 5,000 euro and you can, this is a year, and so you can apply again. If there will be another job created another machine is going to be bought and so on you can you can you will be eligible every year basically and this is how we try to uh, let's say promote uh, or uh, encourage uh, people to enlarge their businesses and uh, to open new jobs however uh, after you are awarded money you are given the contract from municipality and this contract also means that you will be followed for additional three years so whatever you do with this five thousand euro like uh, buying a machine or creating a new job and so on um, you are eligible or we are entitled to follow you and check upon you so whether or not this is really true or it's not true so uh, normally we this we don't do this uh, uh, regularly every year, but you never know. So uh, there is, uh, let's say, a mutual agreement that if you are getting this kind of money, then also you have to be transparent and you have to be accountable to a municipality that provided you this money for. Mm. Uh, and it, uh, during the previous questions about unemployment, there was a series of uh, further questions with regards to unemployment. What's the continuation of the school entrepreneurship? And you were talking about the school entrepreneurship. So what's the follow-up steps for that project? How was it scaling up or developing? Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for the question. So when we started with that, uh, this started with the primary school, uh, with the children who are six. Somebody would say it's even impossible to, to talk to them about the entrepreneurship. But we designed a special curriculum. And one of them is also having the components of uh, basic robotics. Why robotics? Because we were really happy and, and uh, not only happy, we were really working hard to attract the company from Japan who is today having a really large business in our municipality, and they put together the robots for the industry, uh, the industry across the Europe. But you know what we want to do is when there is a special uh, entrepreneur coming in our surroundings, and there is a special need for skilled labor, we try to follow them. So whenever the expectations may be from the uh, somebody who is creating jobs, we try to listen what kind of uh, necessities are there, and then we try to come up with some proposals how this basic skills can be introduced into curriculum of primary schools or even more importantly in the secondary school. On the level of secondary school, these are students between the age of approximately 14 until 19. It's like four years, five years of high school in Slovenia. So we have a so-called 20% of open curriculum and 20% uh, of all subjects or lectures and so on can be organized by some other people who of course has to be licensed. And this is something that our uh, business incubator also does so we come up with the with the skills and, and people who are eligible to teach and this is how we try to basically provide a headhunting for the for the companies we have in municipality uh, I think this was a very nice approach because uh, labor is always an issue uh, I don't know how it's in Ukraine but now nowadays we have more jobs than the people who would work and this is why we try to help inter uh, companies, entrepreneurs, to get a skilled labor or to get uh, ways how to bring uh, this um, basic knowledge from your companies to the children. For example, one of the one part of the project is also a so-called open day of businesses. 
So all the, the businesses in our municipalities are invited on a special day to open their, their doors and we go with our primary schools on a visit, on a tour. So what they do, how they produce and, and so on and so on. Why is that the case? Because we would like for younger children to know that there are businesses in our municipality and there is no need for them to go abroad or to go to Ljubljana or other regions in Slovenia. So you know, we try to connect them. So business on one side and, and school on the other side is are brought together in order to get the basic knowledge, what we have to offer and what are the possibilities for them to remain uh, citizens of our municipality. I have to say, we lost over the years over 3,500 people who moved away. Uh, but today we stopped this trend and this year, 2020, we are uh, rising the numbers of the inhabitants in our municipality due to all these efforts. The challenge with regards to the search for the qualified labor, we also have it in Ukraine and we clearly understand you because Ukraine uh, has now a lot of private companies being uh, activating, they're launching the projects uh, that are something like the one that you've mentioned. But uh, uh, as a follow-up to the first question, uh, the people are asking uh, about uh, maybe details about the agreement on uh, creating the job place. Maybe you have any technical details, like could you uh, give any more details, whether the person should have, should work like for three months or a year in order to, res to, to make sure that this compensation would be received, like more technical details on the agreement and then the project itself. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So if, if somebody is taking the advantage of getting money, this 5,000 euro, we've already spoken before. So if this is the case and somebody is signing the contract, this uh, job should or must exist at least for 12 months. So if you are not fulfilling the obligations, uh, you will be then asked to either return the money or you will not be eligible to any kind of tender in the future anymore. So this is clear agreement. And so this job should be created and should be there for at least 12 months. We understand that there are different kinds of reasons that this may not happen, but nevertheless, uh, 12 months are obligatory. So this is this has to be clearly said. But uh, you are also asking me about the other companies, for example. Uh, I, I would say that municipalities are quite important when we talk about the possibilities for the, uh, for the companies uh, that are in our municipalities. For example, what we do or what we did in, in the past and we still are doing a lot is the investments. So when I came on power in 2010, the investments within our budget was represented only by approximately 10% of the whole total budget. So the, if the budget was a approximately 12 million euro, there will be uh, 1.2 million available for the investments. We changed it, we enlarged the budget. Uh, there is a long story about that, it's difficult to explain everything. Today the budget is 36 million, so three times bigger than it was before. But not only that, we, we encourage or we change the structure of the budget in the way that we invest today approximately 20 million every year as municipality in our, in our neighborhood. Why is this important piece of information? Because when we make a tender, we also invite local entrepreneurs you know, to give the, the offer on the tenders. And many jobs that may be lost or could be lost because of variety of reasons are not lost because those guys can then uh, do different kinds of construction yards, different kinds of things that we do as the projects. So with this cycle that we uh, call it investment cycle in our municipality, we also add value or I would say indirectly support not only creating jobs but keeping them as well. Um, for example, we now invest approximately 1,365 euro a person per inhabitant in our municipality, what is the highest number out of 212 municipalities in our country. Uh, also, I have to be clear, because I, I believe many mayors will now ask me, how is this even possible? Uh, we also borrow money, I have to say. Uh, for, for example, for this year, uh, I just signed the, the contract with the banks 
and we borrowed 5 million euro. But when people ask me whether or not we should be in debt uh, for different kinds of projects, my answer is always, don't ask me how, we, how much we own to the banks, but what we create with the money from the bank. So if there is, for example, a new building being renovated and somebody will go in and pay the rent for the building, uh, this will be, from the financial perspective, basically no impact on the budget uh, of our municipality. So uh, the main issue is not how much money you spend, but what is what uh, you are spending money for. So this is the right the right question. And of course, what we do is we always try to do projects that also create some positive uh, outcomes for our budgets, like you know, increasing the rents that we can collect, increasing the taxation that we can collect, uh, or creating jobs that, of course, at the end of the of the day, will uh, diminish the pressure on the budget. Because since people are working, I am not supposed to spend so much money for the subsidies. So all these things should be taken into account when you are putting your budget together and when you decided to invest in a variety of projects. So the active investment strategy was a prerequisite for success over that years. And you're absolutely true to mention that there's questions like how do you, how do you invest uh, with the limited resources or when there is uh, no access to the foreign markets considering the situation in our country. If you if if you can can you can you comment on that? Well, my comment, or so let's say one, my proposal would be to invest into the area that will, you know, award you, the, the area that will give you something in return. For example, when we decided to invest into the industrial zone in our municipality, uh, well, people were not sure that this is the right decision. However, there was always the perspective behind that. So when we decided to invest into industrial zone, we already had some talks and debates with the po possible um, investors. So at the end of the day, when the investments into industrial zone finished, we were able to offer the investors a well-equipped land by really acceptable prices. So uh, this is how we started it. So it's difficult to, there is not a universal, uh, let's say, solution to the question, but I would say that every mayor should find these things that will, at the end of the day, bring something back into the budget. For example, when we finished our industrial zone, zone was sold, and when this was sold to the uh, to the uh, in, to the business, this business not only did they divide the land, but they also create new jobs. When they created new jobs, we could, of course, uh, diminish the pressure on the budget. Uh, when when the, the company was there, we also got some taxation back in our in our uh, budget, and so on and so on. So it's difficult to say what will be the smart thing to do because every municipality may be a different uh, or should have a different strategy but my proposition will, will be to go and invest there where you will create some some benefits for your budget uh, at the end of the day Thank you. And the final question, you were the expert and you assessed the projects of our communities last year so any advices or let's say which mistakes would you um, underline so that our communities would not be making the same mistakes later on well when i, I had the privilege to listen or to evaluate also some projects that were, were ready before the war time and i have to say that for many of them my comment will be in the way that when you prepare the projects three things should be really taken into into account the first one is the project itself should not just be an idea well i would like to have that and that so this idea should be elaborated really to a very uh, small detail why i'm saying that because if you wanted to attract like investors to your projects so to somebody who will co-invest into something 
they should really know what kind of project you are talking about. So this is my first comment on that. The second one is, if you are preparing the projects, your financial structure should be as clear as possible. So it should be really clear who is adding or who is giving what, when, and how. So if this is clear, there the possibility to attract anybody on your projects are quite larger than if you don't do this in this way, because any uncertainty is problematic whenever you talk to possible investors. They would, they would, I would like to have a certain, um, certain security, certain predictability, and if you don't deliver in that way, everyone will be really reluctant, you know, to to co-invest or be part of this kind of the project. And the last thing is, and I, I'm proud to say that, also in my case, we did a lot of projects together with other municipalities. Why is this the case? Because whenever we talked about the project, of course, these sources are limited. Uh, if you would have like partners from three, four, five municipalities, and that the, you all together are contributing for this kind of a project, the project is much more feasible than if you have to do that all by yourself. Of course, this could be challengeable, I know, because mayors, we are a little bit, I would say, mm, heavy to manage. But at the end of the day, if you are really trying transparent and if you are clear about the project how this should be done and what may be the benefits uh, be, uh, because of this project I, i'm sure that you will get much more people or much more municipalities on board and this may be like a three takeaways when we talked about about the project and finally let's say number four this will be uh, whenever you're preparing the project this project should be prepared to the point that you will have like building permits or you will have the ownership over the land. So the preconditions should be established for implementation of the project. If this is not the case, whoever will be your partner will say, yes, it's nice, but you know, if you don't have the land yet, or if you don't have the documents yet, one, this could be feasible. And as uh, is in standpoint in Slovenia, getting yourself a building project, this may take you months or even a year, or if you don't have the land and you have to purchase the land from a private owner, this could really be a tricky thing. So whenever you are coming with, some, with, the, with this kind of projects, I would encourage you to, to follow these four, four points that I highlighted right now. And uh, thank you for the comment. Thank you for this fruitful conversation. Uh, we had the mayor of the municipality for Kachevia. And now, um, just a small summary. I would say that, first of all, you need to uh, focus on the infrastructure, then on uh, providing services, because that would allow people to return. And third, you have to provide the people with some sort of accommodation for them to be able to return at least somewhere and then the people would be returning so thanks to the experts and passing the floor to you Jen. thank you thank you sergey thank you to our experts and uh, volodymyr today is the day of uh, statehood and we have uh, the candidate in the presidency for Slovenia, and um, I'm personally sure that uh, this uh, uh, spray, uh, this this autumn we could see Volodymyr in a new position and new quality. So maybe you, today we're talking to the future president of Slovenia. So that's the dialogue that we're having today. Now. Uh, it's, it's all very interesting, really. And uh, we have experience from Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, represented by the colleagues from the relevant countries. Could we be like thinking like 10 years ago that the experience of the Yugoslav conflict was uh, was you would be useful for us? But unfortunately, that's the case. So we need to understand that it's not we're not the first one. We're not yet a, we are not uh, the first in terms of post-war rebuilding. All the European countries had to do this rebuilding after the Second World War, and we're not the first uh, over the past like, 20 or 30 years after the Yugoslav contract, uh, conflict. There are things that we need to do at once. If you, your community is, is liberated, it's not under shelling, start uh, restoring the basic um, services, uh, the garbage disposal, 
uh, the utilities because uh, everything could could go awry. Um, you could have like problems with environment, a lot of ammunition and things like that. And also people get used to some bad habits, particularly in stress conditions. So you need to fight with that. In, by creating conditions for returning to the normal life. And what our creation partners have said, that rebuilding will not start on the next day of uh, the end of the war, because, of course, every war uh, will be finished at the table of negotiations. But the next day after this peace will be proclaimed, um, we're not going to start rebuilding as we would like to have, like we would have all the money and uh, and everything would be working. No, we need to pre pre prepare the projects. We need to start, we need to know how to do that. So project, it's not only the idea, it's a very detailed work, uh, a work of uh, several municipalities at once. For example, the communities in Croatia, they're a bit smaller than ours and they have like on average seven uh, southern populations, we have it on the average of 15 southern. But the principle is the same. Search for partners. So, for example, the communities in Mykolaiv region, like located 20 kilometers uh, from one another, I don't see the reason why shouldn't they um, unite for repairing uh, the school or garbage disposal system or like gas supply pipelines and they shouldn't be saying like okay give us money from, from somewhere or, or someone we all know what sort of investment opportunities are we having but try to shift more towards the investments try to uh, find money not on the expenditures but on the investments because there will always be expenditures but if not for capital investments you are not developing and the capital Capital investments will appear only in case if you have uh, some projects. Once again, words of gratitude to our speakers and to Sergei for his moderation. It was difficult considering that Sergei has asked uh, like 20 questions and there were 80 questions in the chat, so he needed to select the best and uh, those reflecting the overall trends that we have. So uh, we still have like six minutes uh, according to our time, but uh, due to the uh, absence of uh, Halina Minaeva, we still have this additional time. So we are going to have a break until 12.15. Fortunately, there's no a read wording. Hopefully that will be the case during the second session. So stay with us. We have 300 participants today. That's a large number of participants for any online event in Ukraine, because we already have a large experience. So hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it's useful. And uh, hopefully you can have uh, something out of it uh, for post-war rebuilding. So glory to Ukraine. We'll see you after the break. During these times of war, you lead with Europe does what it always did. We empower Ukrainian municipalities. We've done so for six years by providing consulting and training. Now we have adapted our help to respond to what municipalities need. And that the message is very clear that the Lead with Europe program has been supporting you since 2016. And even under these difficult circumstances, we are yet to support you. Сьогодні ми з вами знаходимось на хабі, на складі, де комплектуються відповідні вантажі. These packages are put together exactly according to the requests by the Hromadas in the Kyiv region. Welcome you at our You Lead with Europe warehouse um, here near Sheshov. All together. Our emergency support to Ukrainian municipalities is worth 15 million euros. Ich glaube, so schnell wie für dieses Projekt haben wir noch nie eingekauft. Wir versuchen alles möglich zu machen, um eben den Bedarf zu decken. 
Вот, это бензопилы, это бензорезы. Один бензорез и... Привезли на допомогу технические засоби. Whatever you need, we will, we will get you. The war is far from over, and it's difficult to assess how much more destruction it may bring. However, one thing is clear. When the war ends, Ukraine will need a lot of support in its own reconstruction. You lead wars and will be an agent of Ukraine's development and improvement. We'll do our best to help rebuild Ukraine, and we are getting ready for this colossal endeavor.